All right, then we'll go ahead and call this meeting to order. Um, if you'd stand and join me in the pledge, please. Okay. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If we could stand for a moment of silence. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so um, this meeting will be audio recorded. Uh, we're on to item three, uh, adoption of the regular agenda. Do we have a motion to approve? Move to approve. Second. Second. Second by Ms. Gomez. So we have a motion by Mr. Swenson, a second by Ms. Gomez. So we'll do the roll call vote. Mr. Swenson? Aye. Dr. Weiss? Aye. Ms. Gomez? Aye. And Ms. Constanza? Aye. Okay, the motion is unanimous. Okay, we're on to um, communications, item four. So 4.1 is oral communications. So do we have any oral communications, Dr. Walker? We did not have any requests for speakers. Okay, we're on then to our general speakers. So our first would be the Wainimi Education Association, Mrs. Ramirez or representative. Um, I have Vince Gomez in the, um, in, in the um, participant room. I'll, I'll um, bring him in. Okay. Good evening, Vince. Hello, Vince, are you there? You're still muted. I'm on mute. There we go. Here there we you are. Hi, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, Alice couldn't be here tonight, but on half of the HEA, we just wanted to recognize and thank all the teachers for all their hard work over these last several months that we had to, you know, endure in a new way of teaching and our students learning. Uh, countless teachers were countless hours, you know, putting lesson plans together, Zoom meetings, and, you know, it was really a lot of support and a lot of help that we got from each other, um, the technology department, the district, you know, so we just wanted to, you know, thank all the teachers for all the hard work they did. We wanted to wish everyone a healthy and safe summer. And we look forward to seeing everybody next year as we see what uh, entails for us as we venture to next year's school year. So thank you very much. Thank you, Vince. I hope you have a great summer. Thank you, you too. Okay. And then do we have uh, Mr. Robinson? Some we do, I think Mr. Ragsdale will bring him into the room in yeah. a moment. Here, here he is. Here he comes. Paul, you just have to unmute. All right, unmute. There you are. All right, hello and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Um, Thank you. I would like to take this opportunity. I would like to a second. Oh, oh, oh. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the board uh, for the great job, great work that they have been doing. Um, and also like to thank Dr. Walker and, and her team for, um, for doing an awesome job in this um, pandemic crisis. Um, we also know that um, it was very challenging. Can you see me? No. Oh. Okay, okay. He should be able, there you go. Okay, um, would like to, uh, thank you. Um, thank Dr. Walker and the, and the, the board for their um, continuous work in making um, it happen. Um, we all, we, we, CSA is grateful to the district for, um, for continue to, uh, to make our members um, life better and also continue to make our members feel appreciated. Um, no, I'd like to actually move, I, I would like to go ahead and um, and say to our members, our CSA would like to update them, up, update our members on our 2019-22 um, success agreement. And we will continue to work on getting the um, our vote to our for our members to receive their 2% one-time bonus. Um, I also like to 
uh, encourage our members to continue to practice safe distancing and, and wear their PPE protective uh, equipment so that they can return to, to, to return in the fall healthy and ready to go and, and rejuvenated and we appreciate their resilience in this time because without them doing such an awesome job and continuing to serve our members and also the students who we serve, um, it could not have been possible um, without their help. So we appreciate it. Um, finally, I would like to congratulate our retirees who uh, retire um, this year um, and also let them know how much we appreciate their hard work because they, they really make a, made a difference for our district. And for that, we wanna say thank you for a job well done. And once again, we appreciate the board. We appreciate our superintendent and her leadership. And also we appreciate everyone working for the Wainimi Elementary School District. So thank you all for a great job and please enjoy the summer. For those who are not working, enjoy the summer. And for those who are working, please be safe. That concludes my report at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. It was really nice to see you. We've missed seeing you. Stay here. You're getting a little hand clap there from, <laughs> from some of us. We appreciate you. Have a Thank great you. summer. Same. Thank you. Okay, we're on to item um, 4.2, written communication. Dr. Walker, do we have any written communication? We do not have any written communication. Okay. That puts us on to item five, approval of the board minutes. 5.1 is it's recommending the, recommended the governing board approve the minutes of the regular meeting of June 8th, 2020. Do we have a motion? So move. Motion. And a second? A second. <laughs> okay, we have a motion by Mr. Swenson, a, Scott, a second by Dr. Weiss. We'll do the roll call vote. Mr. Swenson? Aye. Dr. Weiss? Aye. Ms. Gomez? Aye. And Ms. Constanza? Aye. Okay, the motion is unanimous. So we're on to adoption of the consent agenda. Are there any requests from the board or staff to remove an item or transfer it from the consent agenda to the action agenda? Okay, hearing none, um, do we have a motion? So moved. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Dr. Weiss, a second by Mrs. Constanza. So we'll go to our roll call. Dr. Mr. Swenson? Aye. Dr. Weiss? Aye. Ms. Gomez? Aye. Mrs. Constanza? Aye. Okay, the motion is unanimous. So we're on to item seven, um, educational services. We have a, um, a staff presentation, approval of the Wainimi Elementary School District COVID-19 operations written report, Ms. Cosgrove. Good evening, Governing Board. Um, this is a follow-up to our June 8th meeting where we held a public hearing on the HESD COVID-19 operations written report. So I am returning to you tonight uh, for your uh, approval. I wanna let the board know there were, uh, we made no changes to the operations report except for two corrections. Uh, we changed uh, one of the deliveries days, it, if you remember, it said Friday, and that was changed to reflect that the food distribution was on Monday and Wednesdays. And then there was uh, air with the phone number. So that was updated to be corrected. Those were the only two changes. So it is recommended that the governing board approve the COVID-19 operations written report for our district. Thank you, Ms. Cosgrove. Do we have a motion? Move approval. Okay, and a second, second. Mr. Swenson. Okay, we have a motion by Dr. Weiss, a second by Mr. Swenson. So we'll go to our roll call. Mr. Swenson? Aye. Dr. Weiss? Aye. Ms. Gomez? Aye. And Mrs. Constanza? Aye. Okay, the motion is unanimous. Thank you. You know, I don't think I stopped there to ask for any discussion. So is there any, any discussion that I might have missed? No? Okay. All right, 7.2 is another staff presentation from Mrs. Cosgrove. It's um, about the summer camp, math summer camp. Yes, I am very excited um, to let the board know that this summer we will be offering our first ever virtual summer math camp. And we're very excited. 
um, for this opportunity to uh, serve our students and families with this program. So I have created a very short slide presentation to give the board an overview of our summer camp program. So Dave, if you just advance the slides for me, I want to, let me move. I'm kind of blocking my own. So uh, we are focusing and targeting um, pri our priority student groups uh, for this program, and I've listed them here for the board. Uh, priority for participation in this summer camp uh, is to our foster youth, um, homeless, low income, our English learners. And we are also uh, inviting special education students that are not already participating in Mrs. Hicklin's um, and our special ed department special ed summer program that already is um, been planned. We are targeting uh, our incoming fifth and sixth graders. So students that are just graduated fourth and fifth grade. And we are proud that we are going to serve 460 of our Wainimi Elementary School uh, district students. Uh, we are going to be staffing this program with 23 of our own teachers. Each uh, teacher will be working with 20 students and they will be working with them in groups of uh, 10 students each. We have brought on a principal to help uh, with the program and that will be Mrs. Um, Vanessa, or v Vanessa Perez from BART. And of course, we're very fortunate to have Liz Hoppy, our di uh, district technology TOSA joining us and I will be um, serve as the district administrator. So this is a breakdown of the classes for our virtual summer camp. We'll be offering at Blackstock and Green three sixth grade classes each. And then Haycox, due to their size, will have three fifth grade classes. Then you can see all of our elementary schools will have two fifth grade classes except for Beach and Wainimi will uh, serve one fifth grade class at each school. Our summer camp is scheduled to go for three weeks uh, starting July 6th. Uh, the teachers will work three hours a day, which equates to 15 hours a week. They will be working with each of their groups of 10 students for uh, 45 minutes each morning. And then teachers will also get 90 minutes of planning per day. The student expectation for particip participation is they will be online with their teachers for 45 um, minutes a day uh, for what we call an open-ended um, math exploration uh, lesson. And then afterwards, they will be expected to work for 45 minutes independently at home. The technology that we'll be using for our camp, we will be using, uh, the students will be using Chromebooks and all of our elementary schools have scheduled distribution days for either the end of this week or early next week. Our teachers will be setting up Google Classrooms for their class classes. And for the live instruction, uh, the teachers have the choice of either using Zoom or Google Meet. The instruction that we will be using for the camp, for live instruction, we'll be using uh, from the work of Joe Bowler at Stanford, uh, the U-Cubed Math Curriculum and Activities. I've linked uh, the website for the board uh, if you're interested in exploring some of the open-ended uh, math tasks that we'll be engaging our students in. And for their independent at home learning, the students will be participating in the Khan Academy math uh, program, online program. We're very excited. I know the board is aware that we're partnering with Khan Academy uh, this coming school year. So this is an opportunity for us to start that partnership a little early. So Khan Academy just released last week, actually, a program for each grade level called Getting Ready for uh, fourth grade, get ready for fifth grade. And so our uh, students will be some of the first students uh, that will be using uh, that program. We're very excited. 
Again, I shared this uh, COVID-19, the supporting research for this program, I shared it also with our operations report, but I wanted to tie it into the why behind this virtual summer camp. Uh, again, we know by looking at the kind of academic slide, we get over summer vacations. And when we look at that uh, with the distance learning and the loss of learning when schools are closed, we know that uh, achievement does decline. And we know from this research that the decline tends to be steeper for math. And that the decline in math is particularly prominent in our upper grades. So hence, that is the reason for choosing the focus area of math for this summer program, and also choosing the two grades that we did, our students that next year will be in fifth and sixth grade. Uh, some more with the supporting research, I did want to point out that uh, I underlined that in mathematics, students are likely to show much smaller learning gains and some with less than 50% of the learning ga gains and in some grades, sometimes a full year behind based on the research that I've linked here. And then the why behind what special populations we targeted came from this research as well. And I have underlined those special populations in that last bullet. So at this time, uh, if the board, that concludes my report, if the board has any questions for me. Do any board members have questions? I, I have one. Okay, Dr. Weiss. Um, you said they're linked, but in, in this display, we, they're not linked for us. So how do we get those links? I, uh, you know, if it's not, uh, if you're not able to click on them and open them through this uh, Google slide presentation, I will have, I'll ask Cynthia, I'll forward her the links so it yeah. will be easy for you to open through an email. Yeah, you just can't, you can't link to it when it's a shared screen. If we get the actual presentation, we can probably oh, link to it. I will have um, Cynthia Rojas send that to you. Great, thank you. Hey, I kind of had a question, Ms. Cosgrove. Um, how are the students going to sign up for this? Do they know about it? Have they been sent a note or did, how did you do that? Well, our incredible site uh, administrative teams have been busy for the last three weeks, um, reaching out to our parents and students and getting them excited about enrolling. So I'm happy to say that we are fully enrolled um, due to the hard work of our principals. Uh, we, uh, Part of when we enroll, we get the names and emails and phone numbers of our uh, students and parents. And uh, our next steps is our uh, will be that our summer school teachers will reach out by through phone calls uh, to get the students connected to their Google Classrooms. Wow, that's awesome. I have, I have a question. question. Any more? I have a question. Um, I know that uh, during the school year, uh, there were, you know, some challenges regarding the internet and how the Chromebooks were working and not working and few parents will, um, was not available to get them until, you know, a few weeks after. How are we making, and I know it was a learning curve for us, but how are we making uh, the this time around, are we going to have any better ideas of how we're going to at that? challenge that if it's any problems? Well, the, you're absolutely correct because the one thing we have going for us right now is the luxury of time. Um, we were able to pre-plan um, this program and we're able to distribute the devices um, in advance of two weeks as long as well as the hotspot, the Wi-Fi hotspots. So that gives us a week and a half in between uh, to get uh, to contact the students uh, have them open up their Chromebooks at home, uh, click on and get into the Google Classroom and iron out all the kinks before our July 6th start. So I also do want to thank uh, Mr. Ragsdale and the technology team. Uh, they did it, uh, they're doing an amazing job of getting 460 devices ready for to go right back out to the, cleaned up and right back out to the schools. Uh, before Thursday of this week, so that will all happen. So there is uh, a great luxury in having uh, time, time to plan, and time to make sure everything works before we go live. 
Thank you. Any other questions? No. I have one more. Okay, go ahead. Uh, when uh, you send uh, when you send those uh, emails and uh, the letters, um, you said it's going to be like optional. It's going to be mandatory for those families because they were, um, you know, uh, how they're when you're recommending those students to show up to the summer school. Are going to be any option that say I don't want to do it, or is the mandatory? No, it was optional. Uh, okay. We started out, we asked each teacher a lot to collaborate with their fourth and fifth grade teachers to create lists of students they wanted to invite. Uh, but parents and students had the option to decline the invitation. And at that point, we just went on to um, our waiting list. So the 460 are the kids who confirmed that they're going to be part of the summer program. Correct. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you. That's a lot of kids. That's yeah. Okay. I'll just add really quickly. Um, I want to thank Helen so much for putting this together. Once we, you know, learned that we were going to have some learning loss mitigation funds, I said to her, I said, you know, what do you think about, do you think we have the capacity to put together a summer school program? And I had a proposal the next day and she hit the ground running. So super appreciative of kind of putting this all together and um, getting, you know, getting it up and running in the midst of everything else I'm trying to do. So um, one of the reasons I wanted her to share was just because I think it's a really great opportunity um, for our students. And this could be something that we use um, in the future um, also for summer school or intercession type things. So thank, thank you. you, Helen. Yeah, and not too many districts are doing that. So that is great, honestly. It is. I, I think we're really on the top of, the, of the, everything here. We're doing really well. Thank you, Helen. Thank you so much. Okay, any more comments? No? Okay. Um, that was just for information only, so we don't have to vote on that. So we're on to business. Um, we have adoption of the 2020-21 district budget, Miss Niss. Where did she go? Oh, there she is. You're, you're muted. Sorry. Um, at our last board meeting, we held the public hearing for the adopted budget. Uh, as I mentioned then, um, we said, or I said, that if, they're, uh, if they passed a, a budget before we came back for this board meeting, that we would make some changes. Uh, they have apparently um, passed a budget, but we don't know all the details of it. Um, the parts that we do know, um, and it's good news for us, is that they are going to fully fund the LCFF, but not give us the COLA, um, which for us is instead of a $10 million cut, that's only about a $3 million cut in our funding from prior year. So that's definitely good news. I'm sure it will result in uh, more deferrals and that we don't know the details of yet, but um, I'm sure more information is to come. So we'll probably be coming back to you with uh, a 45 day revise to um, make the budget look the way that it should have looked to begin with. Um, but for tonight's purposes, we are going to um, ask that you approve the budget as it is written. Okay, um, so do we have a motion? So moved, um, and I have a follow-up question. Okay. okay. We have a motion by um, Dr. Weiss, a second by Mr. Swenson. Is there any discussion? Dr. Weiss? Yes, um, so officially what we're adopting is what was presented to us at the June 8th, was it, board meeting? Mm -hmm. so Correct. The same, so just so the public knows, it's the same budget that was presented in the public hearing. Correct, we did not make any changes, so we're adopting it at the $10 million reduction that we had then. Great. Okay. Anyone else have any questions? And I just had one other question. Okay, go ahead, Dr. Um, Weeks. Kathy, could you explain the, the 6A um, not met statement? Do you remember which one that is? I can look it up, I have it right here. It's on other revenues, projected operating revenues. 
federal or state or other local are within the standard. And, and that's about the, the standard range that it can vary. Right. And obviously that's not met because of the huge cut that the, that the, um, the government made. It was nothing that we could control here in Wainimi. So is, is, it your, is it your thought that possibly 6A will be met under the revisions? If, if the numbers um, I believe the range is about 3%. Well, I thought so it was might be right there within it. Uh, let me look. I thought, at it was, I thought it was 10 plus or minus 10%. Let me look in the criterion standards and see if it um, defines it in here. Sorry. That's kind of, a kind of a technical question. It doesn't really matter too much. Uh, it is, oh, it doesn't actually say. Here, let's, it doesn't say what the criteria is, but we were a little over the 10%. Um, so yeah, maybe that will be met. We'll see, it'll be close. Yeah, okay. it will be close. Yeah, it's actually on page eight. Uh, yeah, what's this page number here? <laughs> oh yeah, page seven of 27 in the second half. So anyway. Yeah, it's plus or minus 5%. No, plus or minus 10% in district revenues and expenditures. Yeah, so anyway, ours range from 21 to one. So that was more than the 10. So anyway. Right. Yeah. Hey, I have a question and I'm not sure if it applies in this department or somewhere else, but I've been receiving some texts from um, CSBA this week about the budget. And they asked that I um, add my name to a list to the governor asking him um, to preserve the layoff option in the budget. They're saying that's a big deal for us. So is that you, Kathy, or Dr. Walker, is that you? Uh, that is actually the, sorry, Dr. Walker, um, the, the August 15th date. And, I, and they, that is part of the budget that they're going to take that uh, layoff date away now. Oh, okay, so that helps us? Um, not really, if we opted to do it, but um, I don't think that we were planning to do it here in Wainimi anyway. Maybe Dr. Walker wants to speak more about that. Um, that's correct, Kathy. We um, had looked at the amount of reserves that we had, and while it would be a really difficult year, um, wanted to, you know, would only reserve that August layoff for absolutely if we couldn't make it through next year. So we were not planning on utilizing the August layoff window. Do we have that option to keep that open or do we have to make a decision now? Uh, it's, the, it's the state that makes the decision okay. about whether or not they were going to. It, it's under certain financial conditions that that August layoff window is open or closed. Um, based on how much funding we receive. And so um, I believe that because they're taking away the COLA and it was more than 2%, that would typically allow the August layoff window to be open. But the discussion was that um, to go ahead and close um, the window. And I really think that that has to do a lot with kind of what's happening with the economy, wanting people to work as far as schools getting back, um, back in session. So I know, you know, every district is in a different financial um, position. And so many districts were lobbying for that option to be able to keep that window open. Well, I know CSBA has sent me three texts, I think at least this week, telling me to sign this, sign this letter to the governor. <laughs> Can I comment on that, darling? Sure. Mm -hmm. It seems to me if they didn't do good planning when we were, when we were planning on a 7% to 10% cut, then they're scrambling now. But if they actually listened to the budget proposals and saw what was proposed by the governor and by the legislature, um, you should have already made your reduction in force by now. So um, it seems to me that people that are scrambling for that just didn't do a good job of planning. 
Okay. Yeah, I think one of the issues though is that when um, schools were shut down, we had our, the March layoff window had already passed. So at that time we were still anticipating that we would get a COLA and full LCFF funding. Okay. Is there any further discussion? There were, there were several districts that were within Ventura County that were planning to utilize it. We just weren't one of them. Thank you, Kathy. Mm -hmm. Any further discussion from anyone? Okay. Well, thank you for the report, Kathy. We appreciate it. Um, then we'll do our roll call vote now. Okay. Mr. Swenson. Aye. Dr. Weiss. Aye. Ms. Gomez. Aye. Ms. Constanza. Hi. Okay, the motion is unanimous. We're on to policies. Um, item nine with Dr. Walker. So we have 9.1 is the second reading and approval of the proposed revisions to the district policy manual. So yes, so tonight Walker. we have the policies for second reading and we did make that change that was requested at the last meeting regarding um, suspensions and willful, defiant, willful defiance, taking that piece out of the policy. Do we have a motion? Can I ask for clarification on this before we take a motion? Sure, Dr. Weiss, go ahead. So this is only the series 4000s, which was personnel. So that wasn't that wasn't where the, the change was requested, right? You are correct in that. <laughs> so there was no requested change in the 4000 series. Was there? Yeah, there, well, there, there was, oh, you know what? I'm sorry, I am mistaken. You actually proposed that in the second, um, I think it was the second reading for last time and we did take that out per the recommendation. So yes, my bad, I apologize for that. Okay. We'll let you have one mistake. So I move, <laughs> uh, I move approval. Okay, second. I second. Okay, we have a, a motion by Dr. Weiss, a second by Mrs. Constanza. We'll do our roll call. Is there any further discussion? Want to miss out? All right, Doc, Mr. Swenson. Aye. Dr. Weiss. Aye. Ms. Gomez. Aye. Mrs. Constanza. Aye. And the motion is unanimous. On to item um, ten, reopening of the schools for. 2021, Dr. Walker. Yes, I have a um, presentation that I'd like to share with the board to kind of give an update with um, where we are in terms of planning for reopening. Um, I do have this set up as an action item, but the action that I'm requesting is that we really approve offering a hybrid and a 100% distance learning program that is going to meet CDE and county public health guidelines. We still need to um, negotiate a lot of the specifics in relationship to those programs. Our committees are still in process. So what I'm presenting tonight is sort of where we are and what we're thinking it's going to look like. I'm not asking the board to approve the actual um, plan yet, but I thought it would be a good idea to give an update at this time. Additionally, the Ventura County um, uh, Ventura County Office of Education should be coming out with their reopening framework on June 30th. And so that way we'll be able to bring the full plan um, for approval after that time, um, as well as having, we have to um, prepare and submit a reopening plan. So I just wanted to preface the presentation with that, that what I'm going to be showing you tonight is a lot of samples, a lot of ideas of what the committee is um, working with. And um, you'll see in my presentation that some of the things we need to start moving on, and I wanted to make sure that the board was um, aware of the kinds of programs we would be offering before we actually opened those up for um, enrollment. So I will go ahead and get this up so that you can see it. Give me one second here. All right, so reopening our schools. So 
So, you know, of course, I think we, you know, all kind of know why we are here, but um, I wanted to preface this presentation with sort of talking about sort of the why as we're talking about the types of programs that we're planning. Um, we're planning for a safe return. We want a program that is focused on equity. We want a program that is going to um, meet all of the diverse needs in our district. Um, as many of you have talked about, we have um, a diverse population. We've had challenges with technology. We've had challenges um, with all sorts of things. And so we wanna make sure that we're designing a program through the lens of safety, equity, and diversity. And of course, our vision and mission is going to underlay um, everything that we are, everything that we're doing. That doesn't change because we're changing the kinds of programs that we are that we're offering. We are going to be planning for three reopening scenarios. Scenario one: all students return to school five days a week. Certain conditions would need to be met in order for us to do that. Um, first, no public health orders or restrictions would need to be in place, or no social distancing requirements would be in place, um, or we received um, significant increased funding and less student demand for in-person instruction. What I mean by that is that if we were to get additional funding that we could hire um, more teachers, more staff, but have more students that wanted to be on campus, we would have the facilities available. So those three conditions would need to be in place or one of those three conditions would need to be in place for us to return to school five days a week. Um, second option, um, hybrid learning. And hybrid refers to a blend of in-person as well as at-home learning. And then the third option, 100% um, distance learning, meaning that 100% of learning is happening at home. Scenario three will be an option for families, regardless of the conditions in which school's opening. And one of the reasons that we wanted to do that is we know that there, um, our families have said that, you know, based on their circumstances, they may want to continue distance learning. And so we wanted to make sure that our district offered that program for them. So how did we go about planning? We um, started our re and our reopening schools task force, and it has 28 members. And I, um, I know that you can't see the link, but this is the link to the um, group that started. So we had a number of district-wide um, managers. We had a group of teachers, classified, some site administrators, and support personnel. And this was sort of our starting point um, with the with the task force. We met starting on May 19th, and you can see there all of the different dates that we've met. After our second meeting, um, four different work groups were formed, and those were actually even later multiplied, and we added um, many additional members. And later on in the presentation, I'll show you um, some of those rosters because I think it really shows that you know, we've had a number of people involved um, in this process. Um, here are the four work groups that we broke down into. The first one was the elementary exploratory group. And for our elementary and our junior high exploratory groups, we actually opened those groups up to all teachers in the district to be a part of it. And we accepted everybody that wanted to be on it because this is a huge undertaking and we felt like um, we needed many good minds. So this is a Snapshot here, I think we had a total of 43 teachers and principals that were part of the elementary exploratory group. So well represented of grade levels and teachers across the, across the district. And this was our junior high exploratory group. Same thing, we opened it up to all teachers and um, decided to just go ahead and they're a little bit um, larger committees, but um, Helen Cosgrove and Dave Ragsdale have done an excellent job of facilitating both of these groups and utilizing some of the breakout room features in Zoom um, to be able to have some really rich small group discussion 
um, throughout the process. Um, we then had our workplace group and uh, Dr. Dominguez um, facilitated that group. This group broke up into three separate groups, the food service group, transportation, custodial and cleaning, and our safety, um, our PPE and hygiene group. And I'll show you those rosters. So we had a number of, um, of our food service managers that joined the food service group, um, a number of our custodians, um, nurses, and teachers um, in the um, uh, transportation custodial and cleaning group, um, as well as in the safety and um, PPE and hygiene, hygiene group. And then our last group was the social, emo social and emotional learning and wellness parents and special populations group. And they also broke down into three separate groups. And you can see here all of the different people that were involved. So we got um, many of our counselors involved in our family support and our wellness group, some psychologists, and then many of our special education teachers in our special populations um, group. So as you can see, we've had a number of people involved um, in this planning process and it is still going on. We are not finished, not finished yet. is a snapshot of some of the guiding documents um, and stakeholder input that we have um, been using. Um, I've shared with you in the past our parent survey and our staff survey. Um, the California Department of Education put out the Stronger Together, a guidebook for the safe reopening of California's public schools. Um, the framework for Ventura County um, is still being finalized. Um, I did have the opportunity to serve on that group, so um, I've been able to see what is um, uh, you know what's been talking about and it's all very much in alignment which 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 with is what in the um excuse me with what is in the um cde's guidebook um california department of public health their guidance for schools as well as our ventura county public health guidance for public schools and then um, the last thing that we've kind of been using um is the ccee which is the california collaborative for educational excellence they published um, some playbooks for both distance learning and hybrid learning. And I'll show you the link really quickly because it does have a lot of really good information. Um, for example, if you go here to the hybrid learning playbook, um, lots of information to kind of help guide our discussions and help us, you know, kind of set some parameters for you know what we need to be talking about and what we need to be planning for so that's one of the resources that we have been using um, throughout this throughout this process um, if it's okay i'd like to go ahead and go through the whole presentation and then maybe open it up for questions at the end that, so if you have a note maybe write down questions and then we can come back just because i think some questions might be answered um, in the presentation Plus, it's a little bit hard via Zoom. I can't really tell who's asking questions anyway, so I don't want to uh, ignore ignore anybody. All right, so let's talk a little bit about um, the hybrid instruction, instructional model. As I shared, this is when we have a blend of in-person and at-home learning. So as we started our planning, one of the key questions that we needed to know was how many students could we have on campus um, at a time? And Ventura County Public Health has um, given us the guidance that they are requiring six foot social distancing in public schools. And so we needed to see how many kids could be in a classroom six feet apart. So we got our measuring tapes and we set up classrooms measuring from seat to seat because that was really, you know, you can do a lot of planning based on estimates, but until you really get to the classrooms and move furniture around, um, we looked at kindergarten classrooms, fifth grade classrooms, junior high classrooms, because we wanted to make sure that our, our rooms were consistent. We found that um, we were able to fit 15 students in a regular sized classroom and then leaving room for one to two adults. The exception there was um, Wainimi Elementary School. And as you know, Wainimi is a historical site and the classrooms at Wainimi are smaller than the classrooms at the um, rest of our schools. And so we found that 12 was the number for Wainimi. We also looked at, oops, excuse me. 
Um, another key was um, wanting to maximize student time on campus, but wanting to make sure that we provided time for teacher training, collaboration, um, office hours. We feel that whether we're going to be teaching in the hybrid program or the distant or the at home program, um, this is all very new. And we are going, teachers are going to need time to get together, to plan, to receive training. And so as we look at the schedule, we have to kind of balance those two things. So we know that based on the square footage, we can um, have approximately 50% of students on campus at a time. When we looked at our self-contained classrooms, typically those are classrooms that serve special education, um, provide special education services. Um, we found that students who were assigned to a self-contained classroom that we would be able to fit 100% um, of the students because those classes are usually um, no more than 15, um, 15 students. So let's talk some specifics. So we started at um, the elementary level. And as I mentioned, um, tonight I'm not asking the board to um, approve a specific model because our committees are still meeting, but these are some of the conversations that are going on. Um, so we looked at kindergarten and we proposed um, two different options, or I should say we've been talking about two different options. Um, one of the options is that um, students would attend um, four days a week approximately three hours, um, including lunch, and there would be one hour um, in between the morning and afternoon sessions to allow for cleaning and teacher lunch. We did not feel like we could offer this option beyond kindergarten because it will require cleaning in between the two sessions. And as we look at kind of our custodial capacity, we feel like one grade level is, is, all, one grade level is all that we would be able to do in terms of AM, PM. We also thought um, our many of our kindergarten um, parents are used to an AM PM model, so this would feel very similar, and that some teachers may prefer seeing the students more um, frequently. So this is one of the options that we talked about for, um, for kindergarten. Um, the sec second option for kindergarten is also the option that we've been having a lot of discussion about for students in grades um, one through five. Based on the fact that we um, can only have 50% of our students on campus at a time, we've been looking at um, students attending in person two days a week with some type of staggered bell schedule. So either um, you know, later start times, um, staggered recess time, staggered lunch time. Um, again, looking at the length of the day, we would try and maximize student time, but teachers are also going to need some time for office hours and things like that to check in with students who are at home. In the hybrid program, it would not be the expectation that a teacher would be doing the same type of distance learning that they're doing right now with students that are at home. Are at home. It would be more such that they would do their in-person instruction class and then the student would go home and do their independent work. So the teacher would give them their assignments, the students would go home and they would know what they need to have accomplished before they come back to school. But we know there's going to be some questions and things like that and so that was why we talked about office hours. We've been having a lot of discussion regarding um, schedule. Would these be alternating days or consecutive days? And what I mean by that would be, would we have one group come on Monday, Wednesday, and Tuesday, Thursday? Um, or perhaps Monday, Thursday, Tuesday, um, Tuesday, Friday, um, or would we do consecutive days? One group comes Monday, Tuesday, the other group comes Thursday, Friday, um, or Wednesday, Thursday. So we've been really discussing kind of the pros and cons of both of those models. Um, and then the fifth day would be used for either intervention, clubs, extracurricular, professional learning. And um, we've talked a lot about um, now that we've been able to use um, this type of format, we could possibly have district-wide grade level um, planning meetings and really kind of help support everybody along, um, you know, as they're learning about how to teach in a hybrid program. Part of the discussion has been, you know, what day would be that fifth day? Um, initially, um, it seemed that um, Wednesday was gaining a lot of support among the committee. Um, because they felt like, especially if we did instruction consecutively, we could have a Monday, Tuesday group, 
then um, Wednesday, a non-student day, and then on Thursday and Friday, the next group would come in. We have recently found out that the high school district is going to have Friday as the day that they don't have students on campus. And so there would be some benefit to us lining up with, um, with the high school district. So we'll be speaking to the committee about um, that this week. And let me clarify, the fifth day wouldn't necessarily be a non-student day, but it would not be one of the regular student days as part of that two day, part of that two day rotation. Um, there's still a lot of planning that has to be done. Um, we are still in the planning stages for special education services, um, our special populations group, our elementary music program, what academic intervention is going to look like in PE. So I just wanted to put those out there so that you know that we haven't, um, that I didn't neglect to share those things, but they're just, um, we're still in the planning stages for um, a lot of these, um, a lot of these items. Child care. So, you know, obviously for our families of elementary schools, it will be a very big change only having students go to school part of the week and not five days of the week. And so we want to really look at how can we utilize all of our facilities to offer um, child care to families. So we've been working with some of our community partners. We've been working with both Oxnard City Corps, who is the current provider for our ACES program, as well as the Boys and Girls Club to see what we can offer um, for students when they are not with their teacher. So um, we have been looking at restructuring our ACES program. We will be receiving flexibility with those funds to be able to do this. and offer our ACES program from eight to four instead of from three to six or from after school to six o'clock. Um, and we've been having some discussions about how would we prioritize enrollment um, for that program. Would we look at first trying to have some of our youngest kids who maybe have a harder time learning at home? Would we um, prioritize by student groups? So those discussions are still, are still taking place. We are reviewing all of our facilities, um, looking at what classrooms do we have available, what kind of outdoor space do we have available. I have also been working with um, the CEO of the Boys and Girls Club for the Oxnard Port Wainimi Center. Um, they currently don't offer um, a day program at the Port Wainimi Center, but they would be really interested in partnering with us to offer a day program for our students. For example, Haycock School school is one school that will not have a lot of extra space to be able to offer um, child care during the day. So we could perhaps offer that program at the Boys and Girls Club at the Port Wayne Center. So um, they've been really flexible in the conversation. And then another thing that I really wanted to get sort of a feel from the board um, is about um, staff child care. So one of the things that came up in our surveys is that we have a lot of staff members who have school-aged children and their schools will also most likely not be open five days a week. And so many of them have expressed that it will be a hardship to, um, to return. Um, let's see, Carlos sent me the name of the program. So I'm gonna look it up here. But one of the conditions in the Families First Coronavirus Response Act is that um, staff can take up to 12 weeks um, off for needing to care for their children. They receive two weeks of paid sick leave and an additional 10 weeks at two thirds um, pay. And so we anticipate that we would potentially have a number of staff that would take advantage of that opportunity um, and so that would, we would be looking for substitutes for all of those classes. Additionally, there are some staff that may feel, you know what, I can't do this with my kids at home, I need to resign. And we would end up losing a lot of really excellent teachers. And so kind of looking at how could we partner with them. So we've been doing some budgeting, looking at the cost of subs versus the cost of providing childcare. And we think that by possibly offering childcare, we may free up more funds um, 
for the rest of our students, as well as be able to have our own teachers in front of um, students. So um, that would be something I would like a little bit of input from the board when we finish the, this discussion here. Uh, moving on to the junior high. Um, we also at the junior high have been looking at a number of different models. Um, in grade six, um, our teachers are multiple subject um, teachers. And so we anticipate that they will kind of continue to operate in the same manner that they operate, but attending um, school um, the two days a week like I shared with the elementary schools. Um, grade seven and eight, that is a completely, um, completely different situation because as you know, in um, grade seven and eight, they, students attend six different classes. So as we have been reading all of the guidance from both state public health as well as Ventura County Public Health, one of the things that we have to consider is really limiting the number of contacts that students have every day, limiting the number of passing periods. Um, but then we also wanted to take into consideration the time that um, students have with a teacher each week. In reviewing the guidance, it did not seem like six periods a day was feasible. Um, that's just too many passing periods, too many contacts. Um, we will be doing contact tracing in the event that a student um, does um, come, down with, come down with COVID-19. And so we really needed to look at ways that we could limit um, the number of contacts. So with those two things, we came up with three different options that the committees have been um, looking at. We sort of started with one and the committee gave some input on those. And so we came up with a couple more and that's kind of how the process has been, has been going. So at this last meeting, um, these were the three um, options that the committee is, has been looking at. Um, option A, um, there would be a common prep, which um, it lowers class size. And so that currently, as you know, um, one of our junior highs does have a common prep and that does help lower um, class size. So in all of these scenarios, we would be doing a common prep because that's one of the ways we're able to get that two days a week and not have to go to a one day a week model. Um, and students would attend three periods a day. Um, so from the student perspective, the student would attend school two times a week, but they would only see their teacher one time a week and they would have the same schedule all year. So I can show you a little example here on day one, they would go to language arts, social science, PE, and then maybe on day two, they would go to science, math, and their elective. Um, so as you can see, they're going to school two times a week but they're seeing their teacher um, one time a week. So this was the first option that we looked at. Um, the second option, um, as I shared, common prep period, three periods a day. Um, but in this model, students attend two times a week or students attend school two times a week and they see their teacher two times a week. However, they have a new schedule each semester. So the student would complete a year long course in one semester. So you can see from this middle column here on day one and day two, all during semester one, they would be taking language arts, social science, history, MPE. So they would complete those year long courses in a, in a semester. Um, kind of like they do in college, you know, you take a, the course is a semester long course and then the next semester you start new courses. And then the second semester, they would take the other three, um, the other three courses. So again, the committee's kind of talked about pros and cons um, for this type of model. And then the third model that they have been discussing is sort of a variation. I think some of the people on the committee kind of described it as sort of a compromise between A and B. And that's kind of moving to a quarter system where again, students would attend two times a week. They would see their teacher two times a week. And rather than having a, a new schedule each semester, they would have a new schedule each quarter. Um, so they would start quarter one, three classes, both days. The second quarter, they would start their next three classes. But then when they go to the third quarter, they actually go back and start finishing up what they started the first quarter. Some of the conversation behind this type of model is that it allows for maturity of the student 
as they get towards the end of the year. So if you had a student who say left in the middle of the year, rather than missing an entire course, they would only miss half the course um, as they would in a traditional, um, a traditional model. So these are the three options that, um, that the committee has been um, looking at. All right, before I go into distance learning, I think maybe this might be a good time to take a break and just see if there's any questions specifically related to the hybrid model at the elementary and junior high um, levels. I have a question. Dr. Weiss, uh, go ahead. Thank you, darling. Um, what are any of these junior high models like what the Oxnard Union High School District is doing? So the Oxnard Union High School District, um, based on their most recent presentation, their four or their, their uh, four content areas are gonna be 100% distance learning. Their students will be attending school one time per week, um, attending like their CTE courses, um, elective courses, um, they're non-content courses. So it's not completely like the, the high school district. The high school district, because of the size, they don't have the ability to be able to have students on campus as often as we can at the middle school and junior high at, and the elementary level. Okay, thank you. I, ha I have a question. Um, Scott? Yeah, we, we have, uh, you know, a population that oftentimes has an extended uh, winter break. Uh, and if they were on one of these intensive uh, schedules in junior high in that particular either quarter or semester, they, they would miss the whole class or, or, or a significant part of it as opposed to the way we do it now where the class is stretched out longer. So was there any discussion on that issue? You know, I don't recall that particular issue coming up, but what they did specifically talk about is um, between the quarter and the semester, they felt like if, if a student was absent, they would miss less on the quarter than they would miss if they were, you know, on that, that kind of that B, that B model. Um, but I don't recall that specific question coming up. Um, Ms. Cosgrove or Mr. Ragsdale, do you remember that question coming up or that piece of discussion coming up? No, um, really, I think that uh, the bigger discussion was that they wanted a master schedule where they got to uh, were able to see the students more than once per week. So hence uh, option B and C. I get that. And I, you know, my information could be uh, uh, dated I'd be curious to see what our ab absentee rate is in January, uh, you know, comparing 2020 with maybe the last four or five years and see if uh, that has migrated one direction or another. But I, I do know that there are, are those that, you know, have an extended winter break. And again, I don't know what the numbers are. And I, I'd like us to maybe look at that. Yeah, we can certainly take a look at that. Anecdotally, I do know that that is not as something I have heard as much as I heard 10 years ago. So I do think that would be interesting, interesting to look at. In fact, as you were talking about that, I was like, gosh, I haven't heard that in um, a while. So it may be, like you said, that things have um, shifted somewhat. Right now, of course, with travel restrictions, that also does make it make a difference as well that there isn't necessarily the ability to be able to travel the same way um, that we do in an under normal circumstances. Yeah. Ms. Bruno, I have another question. Sure, Dr. Weiss, go ahead. Um, you said that the class sizes for the junior high model would be smaller, but what, what, what size classes would they be? Um, they would be, so each class, no more than 15 students in a class. So that was at a time, good. but the class would be divided by two, right? So you would have 30 students in a class, 15 coming um, at a time. Um, okay, so I didn't, I didn't see that. In the, so the, the teacher would then have six periods they would teach a day? 
even if there are only three being taught? Is that how it would work? No, the way that it the way that it goes is that um, they would let's say, for example, we we went the alternating way and you have a class of 30 students, you would have um, half of those students in say your A group and half of those students in your B group. You would see your A group on Monday and Wednesday and you'd see your B group on Tuesday and Thursday. Okay, so the but teacher is- But look at the one on the screen. That doesn't have an A and a B group on it. It has a day one and a two. That's yes, it. It has, it, because remember every student is attending school two days a week. So your, your student is attending day one and day two and then you have basically another group that's attending day three and day four. Ah, okay. I didn't see that on there. That's why I was confused. I, I don't, I didn't see a day three and day four. So that's why I thought they'd have to be regular class size. No, we're talking about an individual student. And so that's why we only talk in terms of day one and day two, because no individual student would be going on a day, a day three or four. So the, so the teacher will teach the same period one on one day and then teach it on another day. With Correct. The, with the students. Mm -hmm. Okay. So kind of like college. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how long would the day be? You know, we've still been looking. We've been looking at the bell schedule. It was kind of what I was sharing before. I anticipate that the day will be shorter than what it currently um, is. We want to maximize the time, but we also know that there's going to be students at home that teachers are going to need to check in with. And so we kind of have to build that um, into the time as well as that common prep period we have to build um, into that time. So in some of the samples that we've been looking at, we've been looking at like, you know, 8 to 1.30, um, 8 to 1, somewhere in that, um, in that range. We had some that were like 8 to almost 2. Um, so we're still looking at what the bell schedules might look like. So I think it would be shorter than our current day, um, but really trying to get as much time on, you know, face-to-face -face time um, with teachers. The teachers felt like, you know, Obviously, that face-to-face -face time is very important. But this is still a hybrid model, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So there still would be student work that they will be doing when they're not here on campus. Correct. Correct. So, but it will be more independent work. So when the student leaves the teacher, they will have their assignments that need to be completed before they come back. Or, you know, it might be that there's going to be videos that need, they need to watch. Um, you know, more asynchronous activities as opposed to live teaching um, going on. So they'll be planning for three days of at-home learning and two days of in-person learning. So it's both flipped classroom and homework. You know, we are still getting into the planning of exactly what the instruction is going to look like because there's a lot of different models and ideas that are out there. So right now we're really focusing on kind of the sort of the, you know, the actual skeleton of the program so that we can then get further into what pedagogy is going to look like and what the design is going to look like. But until we kind of know what our skeleton is going to be, we can't build the rest of it. Christine, I don't know if you remember, but in the early 90s, Wainimi High went to a quarter schedule. And one of the benefits of it was they had more time, instead of a 45 minute class, they had an hour and a half and mm -hmm. they got more time for science. And I don't remember a lot of the pros and cons, but so that was one of the pros for it. One of the cons was math, um, having them miss math for that quarter three or whatever, first and third quarter was hard. So mm -hmm. language. Yeah, you know, I think one of the challenges right now is that we're building something that's not going to be ideal, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, what would be ideal is for us to return to school um, as, we, as we have been. Um, we have been looking at longer periods, you know, in the range of 90 minutes. Um, one of the benefits of doing either model B or model C is that students and teachers are only focused on three classes. And from kind of a, you know, management standpoint, when you're looking at managing, you know, five or six Google classrooms versus three Google classrooms. And we've also been reading a lot of information about how students seem to be doing better if they're able to focus on less classes at a time. I know for many students trying to juggle, you know, all six of their classes during distance learning was very challenging. Mm -hmm.
I'm sorry, I have another question if it's okay, Ms. Ms. Bruno. Sure, go right ahead. So in the one we're looking at on, on option C, does that mean that the science and math teachers would not work the first quarter? No, so this is just a sample schedule. So half of your students would be taking language, arts, social science, and PE, but the other half are taking science, math, and electives. So all of the teachers are teaching all of the, all of the time. So, so each quarter would have all of those classes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, each okay. quarter. So half of your students would be taking okay. three classes. The other half of the students would be taking other classes. That makes more sense. Okay. I have a question. Sure. Go ahead, Suen. How would how would work with the children with the same family if they have different schedules? So we. Uh, so that's that is a priority to make sure that we have families on the same schedule. So that is one of the things that we'll be planning for. In fact, we want to make sure that our elementary model matches our middle school model in terms of the days of the week so that families have those same days. It's one of the reasons we've also been looking at what the high school district is doing because we wanted to try and align up with that as much as possible to make it as easy for families as possible because we know that it's going to be difficult. And I have another question. Um, would it be transportation available or no? Um, we're looking at the transportation issue right now that is challenging. So we will be continuing to provide transportation to our special education students. We provide, we have very limited other transportation in our district. We only have a few, um, a few routes. Mm. And we're looking at those routes right now because we have the social distancing requirements on the buses. And one of the things that we might need to do is we might need to utilize some of our larger buses that currently transport students in order to transport our um, students with disabilities. So we're looking at that's one of the things that the transportation group is looking at. Um, you know, are there routes that we could um, change or discontinue because we will not be able to offer transportation in the same way that we have in the past based on the social distancing requirements. Thank you. All right, I'll go ahead and go on to um, distance learning. And of course, at the end, if there's more questions, we can go back to any of those other things. So right now we are estimating that anywhere between um, you know, 5% and 30% of families will select this option. Um, I wanted to kind of put some numbers to that. And as you can see, if we have, you know, only 5% of our families, um, that's still 400 kids. That's larger than two of our elementary schools. Um, or if we had at the high end 30%, which is what our surveys actually came back at about 30%, but we do anticipate that that will um, decrease, um, that would be 2,400 um, students. So we potentially um, could have a very um, large um, program. You know, when we launched distance learning this spring, um, it was done very quickly. We didn't have any guidance. We really didn't have um, time to plan. We did not have time to do things systematically. And so we had to put together a program very, very quickly. Um, as was shared earlier, you know, we had some students that didn't get, get hooked up to their technology for a while some families it took us a while to connect with. And part of that was because, you know, everyone was on stay at home orders. And so it made it very, very difficult. Um, but when we relaunch distance learning, um, it will be a structured program. We do anticipate state guidelines. Um, so there will be specifics as far as um, interaction with the teacher, assignment, expectations. So it will be a very um, different program that we expect will be a rigorous program and will really meet the needs of those families that choose to keep their kids in a program at home. Um, we are still looking at the special education considerations and what that will look like um, in our at home program. And although we still have a lot of planning to do in terms of the program design, um, we cannot adequately finish designing the program until we know how many students that we're planning for. If we were in a situation where we had very few students, maybe 1% of our students, that would be you know approximately 80%, that program would look very different than if we were launching a program with 2,400 students. 
And so we actually want to start sort of the pre-enrollment or the enrollment process so that we can um, plan appropriately and can also work on, um, on staffing. Um, so we actually want to begin that as early as maybe next week so that we can get some, some good numbers um, on that. Um, and we kind of feel like this program needs a name. So we, this would be something new and exciting that we're starting in our district that may or may not continue after next year, but it could be something that does continue for a long time and meets a lot of different names. And so I wanted to get some input from the board if um, they had any input as far as naming our distance learning program. We've been brainstorming. Um, we kind of um, you know, liked uh, winding at home. We thought that kind of rolled off the tongue nicely and made a nice distinction. It was at home. We've talked about you know, adding Digital Learning Academy. Um, we've talked about sort of looking at our vision statement and using one of our um, sort of signature words of thrive. So you can see up here that I have some um, examples up here and I didn't know if the board had any, um, I, any input that they wanted to provide on this, but like I said, I'd like to start um, enrolling our students. And so it'd be nice to have a, um, a name. So I'll pause here and see if there's questions on our 100% distance learning program or um, if you have any input on a name for it. Dr. Weiss? Hi. I have um, some questions. Go ahead. One of the things that I felt, even with what we received in the board packet, was that this, this option was not described very well, and it's still not described very well. I think you're right. It needs to be, um, you know, it needs to have a, a name because it'll help people understand it. And, but I really think it needs to be described as well, saying what our expectations are, how it will function. Um, because if this is indeed a choice for parents, we need to explain that choice. Um, so that, that was my overall feedback on this item. And I know we're not taking any action on it tonight, but it just seems to me that we need to have a clear vision of what we think good distance learning looks like um, so that parents know what that choice is. And also the numbers, um, that, that's going to be different based on how many are at each, each grade level that, that want to do this, don't you think? Because it'll be dramatically different what we're going to do with distance learning for a kindergartner than what we'll do for an eighth grader. Well, I think that's the you know the exact um, thing that you said. I think that we are in agreement that this program is not described very well yet because um, we really have no idea what kind of interest there is going to be in it. And so I think until we get sort of an idea of you know again. Are we, you know, it would look very different if we're having to plan a very large middle school program as opposed to a large elementary um, program. Additionally, like I said, we anticipate that state guidelines are coming out specifically to hours and possibly minutes on this program. So um, we're kind of a little bit in limbo. So I agree, we definitely have a lot more planning to do. Um, with this, uh, much of our focus has been on looking at our hybrid program, but we have found it's been difficult to um, plan without really knowing, um, having better numbers um, but, to determine the yeah. size of the program. See, the reason I would start with this one is there's some likelihood that we're not going to be allowed to do a hybrid program. Isn't that right? If cases continue to rise. So, so I mean, it just seems to me that really, I haven't seen many school districts take the time to really describe what their distance, distance learning is gonna look like so that it becomes a, an option for parents so they know what they're getting. I mean, I, I hear comments from all over the nation that parents did not, didn't understand what their kids were doing in school before and now they understand it even less and it's very tough on them. So to me, having some sort of vision of and, and using the research to say, what does work in distance learning for a eight-year-old, you know, I don't think there's a lot of literature on that, but if you're going to ask people to make a choice, you need to be able to describe what the choices are, because um, as a parent making a choice, you want to know, well, what's my part going to be in this thing? Um, anyway, that's, that's my input on it, and I think for special ed, there may be some requirements where we're going to have to have, um, like home and hospital, where we have some support at home by professionals, not just parents. So anyway, it just it seems to me that Fleshing this one out is going to be critical to be able to get those numbers accurate. I mean, I say, I hear you saying you want to have the numbers and then you'll build the program. I think if you don't build the program, 
you don't really know what the you know how many people will choose it. So it's it's kind of a double edged sword, I think. Anyway, that's my no, it, yeah, it is a little bit of a double edged sword. Um, like I said, we have you know we've spent quite a lot of time discussing it, and each time it sort of comes back to what size of a program are we talking about, especially when it comes to you know staffing, whether you know what type of curriculum that we're offering is going to be dependent on the number of students. And so that that has kind of been our stopping point um, right there. Because in terms of having the capacity to have to, for example, at the middle school level, to pull um, teachers out teaching sections um, versus offering some kind of an online program is going to be dependent on the numbers. You know, if we have, you know, 27th graders, as you know, that is not going to be a teacher. And, and so that's one of the difficulty that has been as we've talked about, like I said, that off what the program is going to look like. That's the part that the numbers um, are, um, are key. Um, like I said, additionally, we heard from the state board last week that there will be some expectation of um, some specific guidelines. And so it's, 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 a, it's a challenge. I, I, I agree 100% with what you're saying, um, but we're also feeling like we need a better range, a better idea of, um, you know, what we're, what we're looking at. So it might be kind of a, a more structured interest form as opposed to a enrollment form. Okay, anyone else have any Thank questions? You. Yeah, I have a, I just have a, also a comment on regards of the 100% distance learning that I know, um, Dr. Walker, when you sent us the report of the percentage of the students that were attending to the distance learning, I mean, one of the things that I noticed in the report that in the beginning, the percentage were, uh, you know, were uh, increasing, but, but then and the end was decreasing too, uh, which what is going to look like what that's one of my concerns and I know that we might have to go that way, but if we go 100% how are we going to make that challenge work out in our favor that the, the numbers are not going to go decreasing and the students are not going to be going and getting the, the you know their assignments or meeting with the teachers um, mm -hmm. via online well when we relaunch in the fall um, both the student and teacher expectations um, will be very clearly laid out as i shared earlier because we really had no sense of structure or guidance that's kind of why we approach this from a let's use this time to give feedback to students we we can't hold students accountable if they don't have technology. So we have to make sure that we're in a place in the fall that all of those questions are answered, right? And so we will be able to hold students accountable um, in the things in a different way than we were able to do um, in, in the spring. So it will be a very structured, a very structured program as compared to the program that um, we did in the spring. I do feel fortunate that we had the benefit of the spring because we learned so much during this process that, and it was a very sort of low stakes environment. And so we now have the benefit of that learning to be able to um, design something that I think is going to be, um, you know, that's gonna meet the needs of our, of our community. I don't anticipate um, that, um, I mean, we would only do this if we absolutely had to in terms of only doing a 100% distance learning program. I think that, um, you know, in our conversations with Ventura County Public Health, um, with the state, they want kids back in school. And also knowing that um, so much of what happens in the rest of our community is dependent on kids being back in school. So I think that they will do everything that they can to try and get kids back in school safely um, as you know as much as possible so like i said we have to plan for um, all all three scenarios thank you are there any other questions Stop. 
Bexie? Yeah, I've, I've got a comment. Sure. Um, I understand very much what uh, Chuck is saying. I'm inclined to believe that we've got to build what we can of this now with flexibility in mind. So, and it's not, to me, it's not just CDE coming down with stuff. We also have some, probably some uh, bargaining to do with our, our uh, unions on work conditions. And those need to be figured out as well. And they're kind of taking a back seat because of CDE, but we need to have something ready to go, whether it's going to be for 400 students or whether it's going to be for 5,000. And I, we just have to hope everybody's flexible and be mindful that it's a moving target, kind of like this whole, you know, operation has been a moving target since, you know, March. Um, and I've got faith that uh, the collaborative efforts that our staff have been involved with actually predating COVID, we'll get it so it's figured out. We're gonna be making some decisions down the road, but I, I don't wanna, th I don't think we're in a position to concrete things down right now. We need to be uh, ready to say, okay, what are our options and what are the participation levels and what are the state guidelines and you know, what do our uh, uh, labor unions think are the appropriate angles and options for their members? Because that's going to play a role. And we just need to be very open-minded and, and ready to change direction or maybe have the strength of any one of these models. Thank you, Scott. Betsy, did you have a comment? What Scott said, basically, yes, I, I appreciate everyone's work. It seems like it was very thorough and very, uh, it took every aspect into consideration, but we still have a lot to go before anything can be finalized. Thank you, Christine, to your team and to, to all the research I know this, this entailed. Uh, well, I'm not done with my presentation yet. <laughs> oh. <laughs> can I ask a question, Christine? Sure. Just from some of the things I heard um, at the CSBA Zoom delegate assembly thing, have we thought about having maybe the teachers change classes instead of the students to keep from having those passing times? So we looked at whether or not we would have the ability to cohort students, which is when you would be able to have teachers um, changing classrooms. And we do not feel like that we have the ability to effectively cohort um, students. And so that is a challenge for us. Our elective classes and our PE classes are not the same sizes as the rest of our content areas. So um, that was a challenging. And additionally, we did, um, that was one of the questions we asked in the staff survey and staff felt like they were able to, in terms of their work environment, they felt more comfortable in their, in their work environment and the ability to, um, uh, uh, you know, set up for classes and that sort of thing. So, but the real, like I said, the real challenge for us was the elective in PE. So we looked at houses and everything. So that was definitely one of the um, models that we looked at. And we sort of, as we looked at the ability to be able to build that into the master schedule, kind of said a yes or no. We finally got to the point where we didn't feel like we could effectively do that in the master schedule. Thank you. You're going to continue on, right? Yes. I'm getting close to the end, though. That's okay. All right. So, you know, what I've kind of talked about is sort of a lot of, like I said, the skeleton. So I wanted to just share with you a little bit about some of the work group progress. I'm not gonna go over these in specifically, and you, and you will have um, a copy of this PowerPoint, so you'll be able to look at the links when, um, when you have it. But um, I would like to note, these are sort of the working notes for each of these groups. These aren't um, decisions, but these are all of the things that are um, being talked about. So the social and emotional learning and wellness work group, you can see that these are some of the considerations and recommendations that they've been talking about. Um, you know, really spending time to, you know, we know that when staff and students come back that 
Um, there's going to be a lot of social and emotional, social and emotional issues that we need to um, look at and really looking at wellness and mindfulness. And so they've been talking about, you know, things that we can do to decrease anxiety, looking at a universal um, social and emotional screening so we know how students um, are doing. So like I said, this is kind of some of the working document that they're some of the things that their committee has been um, has been discussing. The next group is the family support group. And these are some of um, their suggestions that they have been looking at. Um, there's a really interesting article from NYU on um, culturally responsive sustaining family engagement in the time of COVID-19. So utilizing that with um, all staff, talking about utilizing Parent Connect, um, making kid-friendly videos, um, contact information, how we can provide instructional support, um, looking at perhaps when we go back to school, we start um, rather than bringing, you know, on day one, starting our hybrid program in full, maybe we spend some time doing orientation and working with families in small groups and helping them get their devices set up and making sure they're all logged in. So these are some of the things that um, the family support group has been um, working on. And like I said, this is kind of a working document for their um, committee, but I just wanted to share sort of the depth of work that has been happening in um, in each of these each of these work groups. And the workplace task force and there is pages and pages um, in this one um, in terms of recommendations from daily schedules, the procedures before um, entering campus amp campuses such as um, having check-in sites, check-in check -in sites, um, making sure that we have all of the signage and that sort of thing, um, temperature checks, um, setting up um, a quarantine area. And a lot of this stuff we are required to address in our reopening, um, our reopening plan, um, talking about um, the classrooms and the numbers of kids in classrooms and how to space them and having, um, you know, not having shared supplies, having each student having their own set of um, supplies. Um, a lot of new procedures that are going to have to be developed, um, you know, restroom um, issues and how we effectively um, and safely manage the restroom, the playground, library. Um, like I said, I won't read all of this because it's a lot, but as you can see, this has been an extensive process that we've been going through. I mean, there is a lot of decision making, a lot of planning um, that is going into reopening, um, reopening all of our schools. So, I mean, um, I will comment here on the personal protective um, equipment. I know the group has had a lot of discussions as far as um, face coverings, sneeze guards, um, gloves, um, and. A, they will be making their recommendations, but we will also be relying on the guidance that we, that we received from the state. So um, as you know, last week, Governor Newsom required face coverings in all um, public places in California. And at the time, there was a footnote that schools were exempt from that. And then we got another note late Friday, Saturday, that that footnote was removed. And it looks like now face coverings are going to be um, required in um, schools. Um, so a lot of it will also be dependent and changing as we get different um, different guidance. But as you can see, um, a lot of work has gone into um, reopening. And then our special populations group um, is still um, meeting. We One of the reasons why we've held off a little bit is because there's also a group at the county that's meeting for special education because they have also been awaiting guidance. And so we didn't want to get too far ahead so De um, Denise Hicklin is on the county committee. So she is right there and plugged in and we will be sort of launching that as we have enough information to, um, to make plans. Um, so our next steps is, um, you know, the task force and work groups will continue to meet as needed. Although school is out, um, these meetings are gonna be going on through the summer and there's a lot, there's a lot to do. Um, parents are anxious to know what their options are um, for the fall 
And so we do want to inform them about that. You know, like I said, they're looking right now to um, enroll their kids often in a distance learning program. And if they don't know that we're having one, they're going to look, um, they're going to look elsewhere. Um, and we need to finalize our plan and then prepare for implementation. So that is where we are now. And I will open it up again for questions. Does anyone have questions? I just have one, Darlene. Sure, go ahead. So um, are, is there, as part of the plan for these multiple groups, are they gonna be costing out these various options? Um, as far as the recommendations that they're making? Yes, taking the recommendation and then saying, what's, what's the added cost for those things? Because I, I know there's gonna be some additional help, but not, I mean, not enough for everything. So it seems to me that money is gonna to matter too in terms of how many times you have to clean an area in a one day period. Like you, you had one thing in there about the use of yard equipment. Well, you said keep it so there's not a lot of kids out at one time, but you'd also have to clean it between each group's use, wouldn't you? Um, you know, in, in many cases, they're looking at um, personal yard equipment also. Every kid gets their own ball. Yeah. So things like that, which like you said, cost, cost money. Yeah. I know my son is starting his football training now and they can't even throw a football because it would be something that all the students touched. So I mean, just something to think about. So no, we're definitely costing out um, the addition. In fact, that's one of the reasons why even when we were looking at kind of that kindergarten model versus the rest of the grades, looking at what would the cost be to be able to clean classrooms in between an AM and a PM um, session. So many of the subgroups have um, a separate document that is talking about sort of the action items and what, what the cost would be associated with that. We are receiving some personal protective equipment from the state, um, both masks for students and adults, as well as some face coverings and thermometers. Mm -hmm. That is some of the items that we're receiving from the state, but it's a 60 days, only a 60 day supply. What's the, difference, what's the difference between masks and face coverings? So uh, I, could, I have an example that I could show you. Oh, well, actually, this is a face shield. So a face covering is typically a cloth covering. A mask usually refers to either a surgical mask or an N95 mask. And then this would be the face shield. But we wouldn't have face shields for students, would we? Um, most likely not for students, but for staff, definitely possibly an option, especially looking at um, some of our... Um, like speech and language and articulation. So we've been looking at some options for that where it's really important to be able to see um, the person's um, mouth. Also looking at um, plexiglass dividers in terms of like situations where there's less six foot distancing so that they can see um, the other person. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Anyone else have any questions? No? Okay, shall we um, have a motion? So our motion would be to approve a hybrid learning program and a 100% distant learning program that meet the California Department of Education and Ventura County Public Health guidelines in the event schools are unable to resume as normal. I thought we were asked not to take action today. No, no, let me clarify. I am asking you to take action, but I'm not asking you to take action on a model. I'm just asking you to take action that we will offer multiple options for families, that we'll offer a hybrid program, we'll offer a distance learning program that meet state public health and CDE guidelines. Move to approve. I have a motion. Second, but I have a question. Okay. So I have a motion by Mr. Spencer, a second by Dr. Weiss. Um, so Dr. Weiss, you have a question? Yes, I do. So does that suggest that we won't have a, a full, full day school, even if it's permitted by the state? No, that does not suggest that. We would absolutely have full day school if that was permitted by the state. OK, but that wasn't in the motion, right? That was not in the motion, no. OK, 
Okay, any further questions or comments? Just one more. Okay. So does that mean if we approve this motion, we will not have full day school, no matter what? No, we feel like we are that we feel like that is the given that we already have full day school. So this motion is that in addition to in addition by not being if we can't have regular school that we would offer two other options, a hybrid option as well as a 100% distance learning option. Thank you. So that's at the end of it says if we're unable to resume as normal means regular school day with minutes and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, any further questions? Okay, then we'll do our roll call vote. Um, Mr. Swenson. Aye. Dr. Weiss. Aye, but I'd sure want that 100% distance learning explained better. <laughs> Ms. Gomez. Aye. Mrs. Constanza. Aye. The motion is unanimous. Okay, we're on to um, item 11, monthly reports and advanced planning. So um, trustee reports. We're going to go with Mr. Swenson. I have nothing to report. Okay, Dr. Weiss. Yes, uh, I watched the green and black stock promotion ceremonies, and I thought you all did a great job, Darlene. Your speech was great. So was yours, Dr. Walker. And uh, everyone that was part of it did a great job, I thought. The second thing is I viewed the Hollywood Beach School Parade in our neighborhood here, and that was a lot of fun. The teachers and administrators driving by and honking their horns. It brought a little light lightness to the day. And then um, I want to say thank you to not only the teachers and um, the other staff and administration that have worked so hard in getting through this last quarter, but also to the parents and to our students for all the changes it made in their lives and, um, and for working together with us to continue instruction, even though we weren't allowed to go to school. So we owe a lot of thanks to everybody who's been involved in this. And I just want to echo that on behalf of the board. Thank you, Dr. Weiss. Ms. Gomez. I too saw the graduate, the promotion ceremony is very beautiful. Thank you to both schools for making that accessible for us. I think I saw them twice each because they were so beautiful. Um, and like what Dr. Weiss said, thank you so much for adapting and for really thriving with this um, unexpected change in, in, in school year course. I think we all learned a lot, even about ourselves, but our kids are superstars. We made it through. Who's got from? music playing? <laughs> it's Rebecca. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you, Ms. Gomez. Mrs. Constanza. I, um, I was able to go to a CSEA Zoom chapter meeting, um, and it was very interested, and I learned a lot, and I was able to meet other people that I haven't had a chance to meet as a staff, and I really enjoy the interaction and the professionalism and um, you know, of the group and how they did uh, recognize the classified retirement uh, people too. And um, I also did uh, a Zoom meeting uh, with DLAC uh, with Mr. Castellano. And I also was able to meet other people and kind of find out more about their concerns and their worries and, you know, the, the, um, just the well-being of how the parents feel about, you know, the next step, like Dr. Walker said, uh, you know, they're concerned about what is it going to look like. So and I really enjoy it and I thought it was great. And I also, in behalf of myself too, I want to thank all of you for um, this year and for helping me going through and learn and be patient and educate me and um, just be part of the team that I'm very proud of. And, and I hope that, you know, we keep moving to a positive um, way that even though, even with Dr. Walker presentation, I thought my brain is gonna explode because it was a lot, a lot of work and a lot of input and, and thank you. Thank you to the administrators and teachers and the classified for doing that because it seems, I mean, to me it was a lot of information, but um, thank you for taking the time to do that and bring us the information and to also to the parents, to everybody, just to know what's going on. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, um, I attended um, the fifth grade um, goodbye at Haycox. It was organized so well is why I'm bringing it up. Um, Mrs. Pena had the students coming in kind of like where you go in the front gate, she had them entering a side gate a little further down. And so they came in and the first room they went to, they put their devices, got rid of their books, their devices, anything like that. Then there were cones everywhere that guided. So I think there were four classes, four fifth grade classes that were promoting on, if you want to call it that, to sixth grade. And they all had lines. So one class came at a time and they went to their up to the table where their teacher was. They got their little bag of the goodies, their little diploma and all that for leaving. And then they walked on down the line and kind of casually we had set up chairs not meaning to, but like six feet apart. So then we were, there were four or five of us there then clapping them on as they went on. They had three or four different places for them to take photos. And it was all individual families. They were only supposed to bring three, you know, the graduate, the um, parents, some had another sibling or two with them, but it wasn't big groups. They had a green screen where um, one of the uh, assistant principals called him a teacher by mistake. And he let me know he was assistant principal. And um, he was taking pictures with a green screen and they were just really adorable. Then he just had to send those pictures to the teacher and the teacher would send them on to the students on, on their home computers or phones or devices, whatever they wanted. So um, I wanted to ask if we're seeing any um, policy coming from CSBA on um, this big change we're doing. Um, at one of the meetings I went to, they talked about policy and I haven't seen anything more about it, but I think there's gonna be some new policy that they don't want us to adopt forever, kind of just temporarily. So I'll see if I can find more about that. Um, CSB uh, emails are Dr. coming. Well, Dr. Weiss? Uh, I, I went to the CSBA COVID-19 reopening uh, webinar uh -huh. And they did say they're building some policies that would be in place until the state changed the stay at home order. So okay. yeah, there are some things that should be coming to us. That must be the one I was at then. <laughs> um, see, and I wondered that, are you all getting the emails from CSBA like I'm getting? I get like an update every day almost. So everyone else getting them? Okay, well, and I guess I don't have to, um, I enjoyed the, both um, the eighth grade graduations. They were really great. Uh, and I also want to thank you all for everything you're doing. Our teachers have gone so far above and beyond this year. It's, it's amazing what they've done. A few of them that I talk with socially on Facebook or whatever, um, they're, they're just so crazy about this job and these kids and stuff. It's absolutely amazing to see the devotion that our teachers and staff have for this school district. And so I thank you all as the lead team for promoting that so much. They have a great deal of confidence in you to lead them. And as Sue Ann said, your presentation tonight, Dr. Walker, it seems so overwhelming to me to try to plan that. Like Dr. Wee says, you kind of have to have the good plan so you can tell the parents, but you have to know what parents are sending their kids to you before you can have that good plan. So it, it is really a hard job and I appreciate all the effort you're putting into doing this. So thank you. And that's it for me. So, um, Dr. Walker. All right, well, I'll start off with um, some thank yous too. I think I'll first start by just thanking Kathy and acknowledging her for, um, this is her last board meeting. And as you know, she's gonna be going on to work at the County Office of Education. She'll still be supporting us, but in a um, different way. And I've just, I've really enjoyed working with Kathy so much. I'm really gonna miss her and um, but did want to send our best wishes and congratulations um, to you Kathy and um, then I do um, like many of you have said um, you know just a really a huge thank you to um, all of the staff as well as to um, this board um, you know things have certainly been very different since March 13th and you know everyone has been having to respond do things differently and it's required um, required flexibility and teamwork and you know doing things that have put us all in really uncomfortable um, places because we're doing things we're not used to doing and um, I while um, as you mentioned this has been um, it's been an incredible amount of work on everybody's part to kind of get this moving. I'm also excited to see what sort of lasting change this has um, in education. We're really learning a lot. Um, 
right now. And it will be interesting to see what things look like maybe five years from now as a result of the change that we're going through um, at this time. So just incredibly thankful for all of our um, certificated, um, our classified and our management team. Um, and um, as I said, um, all of you as, the, um, as our trustees for kind of guiding us through this time and for everybody's hard work. So um, thank you um, for that. Um, I have um, been looking at kind of where we go from here in terms of our board meetings. And so I will keep you informed as I get um, more information. My understanding where we are right now is that we do have the ability to start meeting in person with six foot social distancing, but we also still have the ability to do um, Zoom meetings. And so we have to kind of look at our technology. It's a little challenging for us right now to do a partial some in person, some um, at home. So we'll be taking a look at that and I'll be keeping everybody um, informed um, related to um, that. Um, lastly, I, Helen mentioned it, and I think I've shared it with the board, but I wanted to let um, about our new partnership with um, Khan Academy and Amgen. And we are launching that and Amgen will, um, in their foundation publication, is going to be also announcing us and mentioning us as part of their partnership. So um, that'll be a little news about our school district and their, um, their publication um, as well. So I'll share that with the board when it comes out. I think it's supposed to come out around July um, 15th. So bringing us on as a partner, as a partner district. And that is all I have to report. Thank you. Okay, do we have any um, suggested future agenda items from any board member or staff? No, okay, we'll move on. Then I think we'll adjourn the meeting to close session, but we will be back to announce any de um, decisions or things that we discussed in open in closed session, right? And for Cynthia, it's 7.53. So we just go? We just, we leave, leave this meeting, yes. Okay.
think we're just waiting on Sven. Okay, there you are. I was in the wrong email. I say, what happened? <laughs> was my work email instead of the one email. <laughs> okay, so I guess I'd like to report that we've just come out of um, closed session and I'd like to report that no action was taken. So then we will adjourn this meeting. We're done. Thank you all. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you, good night. See you all, be safe.